you are more than you think you are, Practical Enlightenment for Everyday Life by Kimberly Snyder Chapter You Are Whole Is a diamond less valuable because it is covered with mud? God sees changeless beauty of our souls. He knows we are not our mistakes. Paramahansa Yogananda The big part of you. What does, quote, you are whole mean? At first, you might be reminded of the current more mainstream movement toward eating whole unprocessed foods, thankfully. Yet it also refers to something much larger. Many of us tend to focus on the surface stuff that we can see, such as our appearance, the labels we put on ourselves, woman, man, mother, father, wife, librarian, accountant, lawyer, young, middle-aged, student, and so on. The things we have done, the accomplishment we are still chasing, Yet all of that is actually teeny compared to what is underneath. Underneath, what author Wayne Dyer calls, quote, that 1% of living life through our physical form, end quote, is something so much bigger, namely, the true self. You can uh, tinker with the surface stuff all you like. Some of it's fun and some of it's not so fun. But if you don't connect with the part of you that is whole, then you will continue to feel small, no matter what. And that translates to feeling lack. As we already discussed, lack is a block to confidence self-love and peace, and lack energy repels love, beautiful relationships and opportunities. It is the opposite of whole, and as Yogananda teaches us, quote, unless a wave dissolves itself and becomes one with the ocean, it remains inordinately limited. End quote. Once you can tap into the wholeness, your entire relationship to life will change. You open up the pathway for all sorts of new and exciting relationships to come into your life, as well as opportunities that reflect your growing self-awareness, abundance, love, and ultimately, freedom that is enlightenment. When your behavior isn't who you are, all of us desire to be the best possible person we can be. Many times we fall flat. We act in angry, mean, and resentful ways when we feel slighted or misunderstood. We can react from the wounded places inside of us, and then we feel guilty for our behavior. It's important to learn lessons from our life experiences and then move on. Yogananda teaches us, quote, cultivate forgetfulness of past wrong and vengeful feelings, and encourage only the remembrance of good. End quote. He goes on to say, quote, Remembering only the good experience of the, of the past, you shall eventually remember your oneness with spirit. End quote. 
The issue is then we do the opposite and we keep fixating on all the what bad stuff we have done. The guilt drags on, which is dangerous because holding on to long-term guilt can lead to shame. Shame is a heavy kind of self-judgment and arises when part of oneself is perceived to be inadequate, inappropriate or immoral. But really the whole experience of your past only exist in this now moment as thoughts. When you really think about it, it's actually pretty preposterous that we continue to allow ourselves to feel bad and shameful about our own thoughts. Shame is strongly linked to depression, as evidence in one large-scale meta-analysis in which researchers examine 100 eight studies involving more than 22,000 subjects. Other researchers have also found a connection between shame and anxiety. Research has even found detrimental physical health consequences related to shame, including the release of the steroid hormone cortisol and pro-inflammatory cytokines, PIC, linked to reducing our immunity and wearing down our body's health in general. When we start identifying those behaviors and uh, characteristics and who we are, we move very far away from our true nature. We start to think less of ourselves, that we have no good, that we can't be loved, that we are not worth the time of others. This belief system is a bunch of BS. First of all, you and I are on the journey to enlightenment. So none of us are perfect. We make mistakes and learn, and sometimes we make the same mistake few times, and then we learn. So it goes. And secondly, while your true self is always shining through, your surface behaviors are all just parts of your humanness. Part of your ego trying to protect itself from perceived dangers, for instance, rejection. None of those qualities are the real you. It's the heart, scared, fearful part of you trying to take over and project its pain. Yogananda calls the ego the pseudo-soul, the shadow of the soul. So stop obsessing. A lot of us may think we need to somehow repay what we have done in the form of uh, beating ourselves up and feeling guilty indefinitely. This kind of thinking has to stop. Think of the ego as pain in the ass teenager. They think they know everything, but deep down they don't have a clue, and they know it. Challenge teenager on belief, and what do they do? They often go on the attack, and her insults your way along with illogical, stubborn behavior. I know, I was a teenager once. So, were you? This can be unsettling and downright debilitating. But in the hand, the tirade isn't coming from a place of superiority, but from a place of uncertainty and fear. That being said, the ego isn't bad, just misguided. Keep moving forward. As we continue to journey toward living life from the true self and continue with our meditations and practice, we embody more than the high vibration qualities associated with enlightenment, love, peace, joy. 
And those qualities are in alignment with who we really are. Tapping into the flow of authenticity will continue to outwardly influence more and more of your actions. My friend, who I will call Alisa, who I met at a women's circle, more on this in just a moment, went through a rough phase where she felt lonely and uh, lost touch with her own strength and voice. She was feeling increasingly distant from her husband, who still wanted to party every weekend while she was continually gravitating toward a quieter life. She started spending time with a man she met on her gym, who was giving her a lot of attention. One thing led to another, and she had an affair. She felt terrible, incredibly shameful over the incident, and really tortured herself about it. She came clean about the incident to her husband and apologized to him. Nevertheless, the marriage ended in divorce and a lot of drama. Her then ex-husband emailed the entire wedding list of 270 people, including their grandmothers, lifelong family friends, told them what had happened. In the midst of all the drama, Alisa also got fired from her job. You can imagine that Alisa hit rock bottom. She had no job, no friends, and no money. Her parents were furious with her, and she was attacked so much on social media that she deleted all her accounts. Alisa harbored so much shame over the incident that she gained 15 pounds and the next two people she dated were incredibly stingy with her and also cheated on her. Soon thereafter, she hit her second rock button. She realized that all the guilt she was holding on to was still manifesting in her world around her, was affecting what she was attracting. Through a lot of journaling, meditating, connecting with a new community, she met in a women's circle, finally forgave herself a full three years after the incident. Today she is much lighter and happier. She has accepted herself and even her body for the first real time. She is also consciously single, allowing herself the space to get to really know herself in a deeper way. I am not uh, saying uh, there is ever justification to cheat or be dishonest in any way, but I am saying that we have all done things of various degrees that aren't exactly proud of. Should that define who we are for the rest of our lives? Are we supposed to wear a big scarlet letter stamped on our forehead, in this case a big C for cheater or big G for gossip or L for liar or whatever? Where is the line between beating our lesson and letting it go? meeting each other where we are. One of the reasons why there are so many problems in the world is that we have trouble meeting people where they are. We have expectations of what others should be instead of just letting them be. Yogic philosophy teaches us the path of non-duality. This means we just are. No judgment. Non-duality means that you will have many different aspects of yourself rise and fall, like waves, 
but underneath it all you are still you. The deep down essence of you has always been there, even through all your behaviors. And believe me, I have acted in ways that are judgmental, mean, and petty, but after spending so much time with Yogananda's teaching and getting in touch with the true self, I have let go of a lot of those behaviors which are really all mirrors of acting from a wounded ego. The esteemed Swami Sri Yukteswar, the guru of Yogananda, says, quote, Forget the past. The finished lives of all men and women are dark with many shames. Human conduct is ever unreliable until man is anchored in the diving. Everything in future will improve if you are making a spiritual effort now. End quote. So don't let your past hamper your progress now and going forward. Choose to learn from it, to integrate the lessons to help inform better choices and decisions going forward and to let yourself move on. You, me, and everyone we meet is exactly where they are on their journey. When we can meet others where they are and look them into the, in the eye and really see them underneath their moods and behavior, that is when you know that you are making progress. Father, you are moving closer to being compassionate with yourself. Self-reflection, identifying with the light. Since we have been talking about the true self a lot, which might be a brand new concept to you, I want to give you a visual to go along with it. Imagine a beam of white light that shines down through the center of you like your spine does. But instead of turning in to physicality of vertebrae and nerves, imagine that this bright white light represents you at your core as pure energy. It beams down like a spotlight through entirety of your being. When you move around the world, when you think about yourself and your true identity, you can turn in to true self by visualizing and identifying with that brilliant, all-perfect shining light inside of you. We can also start to see people for who they really are by focusing on seeing the light inside of them, even if it's temporarily hidden underneath some pretty immature or annoying behaviors. The light is the true self, and it is divinity inside of each of us. Now it doesn't mean that you have to trample down on the humanness within you, the struggling human who stumbles along in life and messes up. But it also means that you put things in the proper order. Your diving side is already perfect and whole, and you recognize that's your true identity. Yet at the same time you love and feel compassion for humanness in you that in the process of becoming your fullest truth. We accept her, forgive her, and love her as she makes her way back to fully merging with the true self along the often messy journey of life, which is full of ups and downs and lots of lessons. You are the sun and the moon. A few years ago, I began attending women's circles, which is essentially when a group of women gather and share what is present for them 
and what is going on in their lives. Advice is not given unless it's uh, specifically asked for. Rather, it's about simply holding space for one another. The circle is a safe place for vulnerability, allows each woman to stand in her truth and be witnessed. The vulnerability part felt pretty radical to me when I started. I wasn't used to sitting around and speaking up so openly in front of others. Yet I immediately understood what immensely a healing tool this kind of tribal community connection can be. These communities are often a missing link in one's total wellness journey to feeling whole. I got a separate women's circle and soon started to lead my own, then went on to create an entire virtual Saluna Circle program. Come, join us. You'll find info on my website. Something amazing, magical, mystical happens in the circle. Sometimes tears are shed, sometimes not. But just by being there, by listening intently and being honest and vulnerable about struggles and what is really happening in our lives, transformation happens. We are mirrors to each other. It is powerful to take off your mask, so to speak, and just really and truly be yourself. We wear masks in so many ways, so many people in our lives, our co-workers, our social media followers, even our friends. But in the circle, no mask is needed. And so the deep healing can come from really and truly being seen as yourself. Many of the women in the circles reported a tremendous relief from being able to share what was in their hearts. And many also remarked on the shifts in their lives that they were able to implement from sharing what went on in the circles. The following activity is a way to have your own personal circle with yourself. It's a sacred, private space of self-reflection that can actually move a lot of repressed energy that comes from uh, disowning parts of ourselves. This requires vulnerability because you may have protected yourself against seeing those things with a hard, turtle-like shell of unawareness. Rejecting any part of ourselves is self-denial. Rejection is stagnancy and repression. When we allow our wholeness to bloom, we can become fully alive, fully passionate, and we can then truly begin to love ourselves. Not in a surface, temporary way, but in the real way. The more you can see, the more you can let go, and the more you will be living from the place of the true self. Then you claim more of you, the love, the beauty, the lightness, the joy that you have been keeping away from yourself. Self-reflection. You are the sun and the moon. In your journal, open to a new page and draw a vertical line down the middle. To the left, draw a sun and write, I am the sun at the very top. For it's not linear as this, we are going to use the sun symbol for your, uh, quote, positive traits. List the traits you like about yourself, kind, compassionate, good friend, and so on. Might be some words in there. Now, 
to the right of the vertical line, draw a moon and write, quote, I am the moon. At the top of the page, make a list of traits that are part of shadow, the parts that you don't like to identify with in yourself, but that deep down you know that you exhibit at the times. This list is a little harder to make, right? It can feel for to write some of this down, but remember that great power comes with awareness. Don't hold back. Qualities like impatient, mean, jealous, lazy, and angry might be on your list. Do not distract yourself during this process, which might be an easy temptation. Don't start scrolling on your phone or picking at your nails. Let all the words come out. Here is an example of what list may look like. Left side. I am the sun. List. Loving, kind, reliable, patient, open-minded, organized, thoughtful, good listener, inclusive, warm, compassionate, charismatic, forgiving, generous. Right side. I am the moon. Judgmental, cheap, stingy, envious, impatient, closed-minded, fearful, careless, bad listener, exclusive, standoffish, bitchy, stubborn, greedy, selfish. When you are done, compare your two lists. Take some deep belly breaths and let yourself sit in the absolute fullness of you, all the parts. Let whatever feelings and self-judgments rise and fall. Remind yourself that these qualities are ultimately attached to surface behaviors that are parts of your ego. They are not the real you. The true self is beyond all of those qualities. The true self just is. But going through the process of seeing and acknowledging all your behaviors and tendencies fully is part of the process of integrating them into your wholeness. It's part of embodying your own, quote, sun-moon cycle. Let this process take as long as it does, but please focus on it for at least 10 or more minutes. Then it is complete, close your eyes and affirm the mantra, quote, I am whole, end quote. Besides hiding from general characteristics like being impatient or petty, we can hold on to the deep shame of past things we have done. Like Alyssa, who I mentioned earlier in the chapter, things that don't fit into the neat little labels we base our sense of self upon can make us feel guilty, shameful, bad about ourselves. For example, I would not have thought of myself as someone who would get a divorce, have C-sections rather than natural births. Of a boy, did I try not to? Be a single mom, or being judgmental or snippy at times. But I have done all of those in my life. I definitely felt some shame around those things in the past that didn't fit in with my constructed outward identity until I was able to process them. Now I can talk about them openly and without shame because of this practice and work. I own these parts of me, 
and they don't own me. It's so incredibly free. It doesn't mean that we have to publicly advertise all that they have done like some kind of forced confession to the world. But what does it mean is that within yourself you must work toward accepting all the things that you have done in the process of integration back into your wholeness. You are the one who knows all that's happened along the wild, beautiful, unpredictable, challenging journey of your life. The willing hookups with less than impressive guys when you were a bit tipsy. The gossiping, the cheating on a test or on your partner. The times you could have been better friend. Yogananda says, quote, Avoid dwelling on all the wrong things you have done. They don't belong to you now. Let them be forgotten. It's attention that creates habit and memory. End quote. So remember not to keep focusing on your past behaviors by giving them more and more new attention. Rather, own all the qualities you show and have ever shown, and once you see them and allow them to be felt and accepted, you can be free of them. Take the lessons, let the rest go, and move forward, free and whole. You are beyond numbers. Part of embodying wholeness as your true nature is not letting numbers completely define you. Sure, numbers can help give us some broad strokes in how we are doing, so I am not uh, suggesting we throw out all numbers and pretend they don't exist in the world. That would be delusional. Obey speed limits. Pay attention to your blood pressure number. I am suggesting that we stop giving numbers all our power. Whatever its number of pounds or kilos you weigh, or obsessing over your current salary, or how many followers you have, and so on. If those numbers can profoundly affect your mood or your self-worth, then it's time to put numbers back into their proper perspective. And what's ironic about our society's obsession with losing weight is that we have always found that when we feel truly good and centered, connected to ourselves, we have much easier time dropping unwanted weight without the fixation. Why is that? Because then we feel good, we have less stress, our digestion tends to function better, we feel more naturally motivated to work out and eat healthier foods, less prone to give in uh, to food cravings when we have a source for feeling joyful and connected to our natural energy from within through our meditation. Then we don't have to try to shift our energy from outside sources like food. So in the end, it's way more important and effective to continue to work on feelings in touch with the deeper, expansive energy of your true self versus getting bogged down with numbers. Yogananda cautions against becoming too preoccupied with numbers. For instance, he counsels us to keep our age private. Instead, we can affirm Quote, I am immortal, end quote. If you get too caught up in the year in which you were born, or in other words, your chronological age, you find that obsessing over it can create anxiety, which only wears you down. You may even start to mold yourself into what you, quote, should look like, 
as in certain age. For example, someone in their 50s could start looking quite old because they have a picture in their mind of what a 50-year-old should look like. Gray, hunched over, with a pot belly. Get rid of those ideas. The mind is powerful, and if we believe in the absolute power of numbers, we will have that absolute power over us. Here is the truth. What is limitless and true can't be measured by numbers. Think of love. Can you measure love on a scale? No. Nope. Can you weigh wisdom? Or how about true or true beauty? We are definitely not talking about beauty pigeon score here. Now, by tuning in to limitlessness, your reality expands. It's not confined to arbitrary numbers. Stay living in the limitless. We can't get enlightened if we think we are small. And in the end, numbers are pretty small beings. Wholeness in nature. Wholeness is found in nature. It is actually one of the defining qualities of nature, found in each blade of grass and the rock that unapologetically stands as it is. The ocean is who she is and will ever be, stormy, slapping waves one day and searing another. The branch of the tree may be gnarled and bent, but she stands strong just as she is too. The sun shines during the day, trading off with the darkness of night. It's not that one is the quote good or the quote bad part, but it's that it's all one complete cycle. Mother Nature is the light and the dark and the sunrise and the sunset plus all the in-between parts. She is all the forms yet underneath. It all is the pervasive energy of spirit and so it is with you. You are everything on the surface and at the same time you are the wholeness of the true self shining through it all. Self-reflection. Absorbing wholeness from nature. We can learn from immersion and the unchanging wholeness found in nature is a good teacher to sit with. For this exercise, simply find a spot in nature you are drawn to. It can be a park if you live in a city, or the edge of the ocean or lake, the mountains, your lawn, or a tree at your kid's playground. Look around with unjudging open eyes. Notice how everything in nature just is. Sit right on the earth, if possible, for at least 10-20 minutes with the beingness of Mother Nature. Don't listen to music. Don't speak. Just be still, observe and witness. Feel the power of wholeness, of just being and not doing. If possible, don't if possible, do your meditation practice as outlined in several chapters in this book. Practical tips for embodying wholeness in your life. First, choose to release. Choose a part action you regret. It could be losing your temper with your kid or your significant other lying, being petty, stealing, or whatever. Recall the incident. Let whatever feelings rise up in your body when you do so. Then take a deep breath and find 
the lesson that you learn from the incident. It could be as simple as, quote, well, I am not going to do that again, end quote. Close your eyes, place both your hands over your heart and say aloud or internally, quote, I now let it go, end quote, and mean it. As much as you can in the moment, feel that you have done all you can now. The past is the past, as Yogananda says, and the fully let it go. Let any feelings rise up and then subside. As you continue your meditation practice and journaling, you may become more and more self-aware of other incidents you are holding on to. Please repeat this exercise at any time for each incident to keep letting go of past behavior and instead focus on wholeness now. Second, shift your focus. The less you focus on numbers, the less they will control you. Throw out your scale. Stop checking out how many likes you got on your social media post every 10 seconds. Stop telling people how old you are in every conversation. Stop apologizing to yourself and those around you that you currently have X amount of money versus Y. The more anxious you are about numbers, the more you deplete yourself. It's like trading in the infinite center for the limiting finite. Would you ever trade unlimited abundance for $100 bill? Probably not. Adopt an attitude of confidence. Keep your energy and your thoughts focused on your inner nature, which is limitless and unbound by any numbers. Third, focus on how you feel. Tune in to your body and how you feel in your clothes and how you feel walking around in the world. Don't let the scale of the birth year on your birth certificate tell how to feel. If you feel great, then keep going. If you feel bloated and have low energy, then do something about it to feel better. Either way, it's more powerful to attune to your body and inner feelings than to ignore them and rely on outside sources. Fourth, remember you are the core, not the shell. Think of the coconut. Have you ever seen one freshly chopped from a tree? The outer shell is a few inches of thick, rough, and feathered wood. That's not the essence of coconut, though. Beneath the shell is the fruit the snow-white meat and the sweet water, the deliciousness of life that which sustains come from the inside. Always remember that. Go to your core and live there. Don't identify with your shell, which is characterized by things you may have done in the past, your triggers and wounds, your weight, age, calorie count, height, current savings, and salary. It's not the real you. And by the way, as the mighty coconut teaches us, the core is so much more delicious. We completed reading of the chapter You Are Whole from the book 
You are more than you think you are. Practical Enlightenment for Everyday Life by Kimberly Snyder.